Galileo is the most overrated figure in the history of science. That's the thesis, season one of this podcast. It's going to be proper revisionist history fun. If you enjoy scholarly polemics and receive wisdom turn on his head, then this is the story for you. But it's also more than that. Galileo is at the heart of fundamental questions. What is the relation between science, mathematics and philosophy, between ancient and modern thought, What's the history of our scientific worldview, of scientific method? All this big picture stuff. Galileo is right in the thick of the action on all of these issues. So that's all the more reason to study him. But let's start small. Here's a simple snapshot of Galileo at work. The cycloid. It's a famous geometrical curve. The cycloid is the path traced by a point on a rolling circle. So in other words, say you have a bicycle wheel and you attach piece of chalk to the rim of it and then you roll the wheel uh, along a wall so that the chalk is drawing on the wall as it's rolling uh, that makes a cycloid it's a kind of arch shape what's the area of the cycloid this was a natural question in galileo's time finding areas of shapes like that is what geometers have been doing for thousands of years archimedes for instance found the area of any section of a parabola the area of a spiral and so on the cycloid was natural next step to fit right into this tradition. Now, of course, nobody cared about the area of the cycloid as such. That's not the point. You know, Think, for example, of portraits painted by great artists. Of course, the value in such a painting is not that it accurately depicts uh, some prince or whatever pompous costume that he happened to be wearing. Uh, obviously, the value of that as art is not the subject but the method. How does the artist manipulate a composition, a subtle detail to achieve a particular impact? Or how does the artist build on tradition and yet innovate beyond it? Now, those are the kinds of things that we admire when we view the works of great artists. And it's the same in mathematics. Archimedes, when he found his areas, he gave uh, clever geometrical arguments, gorgeous proofs, but the point is not that he gave you a formula to compute various areas. Uh, how often have you needed to know the area of spiral anyway? Uh, never, of course. The point is not the result. The point is that Archimedes took human thought to a new level. His proofs are beautiful, they are logically flawless, uh, they give you a sense that you're at the pinnacle of what the human mind can achieve. So everybody wanted to see more of that kind of thing. Now, solving problems like the area of the cycloid then in this sense in Archimedean sense that was the way to prove yourself a worthy geometry in Galileo's time so Galileo tried and failed all those brilliant feats of ingenuity that Archimedes and his friends had blessed us with uh, it just wasn't happening for Galileo he just wasn't any good at it in fact he said so himself here's a quote from Galileo on Archimedes those who read his works realize only too clearly how inferior are all other minds compared with Archimedes, and what small hope is left of ever discovering things similar to those he discovered. That's Galileo, and he's quite right. Except uh, maybe it's not that all other minds are inferior to Archimedes, although certainly Galileo's is. So we must picture Galileo sitting in his study, racking his brain, staring at the cycloid, the books of Archimedes lie open on his desk. Ah, all that math, you know, is giving him a headache. Thinking isn't really working out for Galileo. It's not his strong suit. Desperate, frustrated, he turns to the failed mathematician's last resort. Trial and error. He cuts the cycloid out of thick paper and starts weighing it. It's much like in modern mathematics classrooms where certain students, they prefer pushing buttons on a calculator and you know, have some device do the thinking for them instead of trying to figure stuff out for themselves. So also Galileo he starts fiddling around with uh, scales and cardboard cutouts as a substitute for thinking. It's striking to compare Galileo's take on this problem with that of his contemporaries. They in fact did solve it. So Robert Val in France, Torricelli, or Galileo's countryman in Italy, uh, also Descartes. They all solved it, and not with some 
middle school uh, cut and paste project. They sold it as mathematicians using reasoning and proof. These people were contemporaries of Galileo. If they could do it, why couldn't he? Galileo himself uh, says that the cycloid area is a very difficult problem. I worked on it fruitlessly, he says in his own words. So compare that with Descartes' reaction. Descartes, a mathematically competent person, when Descartes receives the problem, which was it was being passed around at this time, correspondence, like a, a challenge to various mathematicians and so on. So when Descartes receives it, he at once replies as follows. I do not see why you attribute such importance to something so simple that anyone who knows even a little geometry could not fail to observe where he simply to look. And Descartes, he backs this up by immediately sending his solution to the problem which he uh, composed on the spot. So Descartes, well, he's not famous for his humility, to, to put it mildly. So we should not necessarily read too much into those words uh, per se. But even so, the contrast with uh, Galileo is very striking, isn't it? Uh, the, the fact remains that a number of mathematicians solved the cycloid problem with relative ease, while Galileo was uh, fumbling around with scissors and glue. And Galileo got it wrong, too. Not only did he fail to find one of those beautiful Archimedean proofs, which was the whole purpose of the exercise in the first place, not only that, but he also got the result itself wrong. The area of the cycloid it is in fact three times the area of the generating circle, as these mathematically competent people had shown. Galileo, though, he specifically concluded, based on his bumbling experiments, that it was not exactly three, but a bit off from three. So, by relying on experiments unchecked by proper mathematics, Galileo got the answer wrong, and not for the first time, nor the last. This just goes to show why mathematicians have so little respect for experiment. Christian Harkins, another very competent mathematician of, of the 17th century, he once said, Do not think that I am relying on experiments because I know they are deceitful. So this quote, uh, it's from a different context, not the cycloid per se, but nevertheless, it's the, same. the point remains the same. This is a universal attitude among mathematicians, and for good reason, as we see in the Galileo case. Haphazard trial and error has to be superseded by rigorous demonstration, as able mathematicians have always known this. So the moral of the story is this. In the case of the cycloid, it is undeniable that Galileo turned to empiricism precisely because he lacked the mathematical ability to tackle the problem any other way. It's beyond any shadow of a doubt that if he had had the ability to compose a mathematical proof, like some of his contemporaries did, he would have loved nothing more than to do so. In the case of the cycloid, these are facts. And this leads to my revisionist thesis. I suggest that this cycloid episode is typical of Galileo's science altogether. As with the cycloid, so with science. Galileo was bad at mathematics, and it's precisely because he was so bad at mathematics that he was so keen on experiments. He was not the pioneer of scientific method, he was not the father of modern science, he was not a heroic knight defeating dogmas and superstitions with a light of empirical truth. No, he was none of those things. Galileo was, first and foremost, a failed mathematician. This is the key to understanding his role in history of science, in my opinion. Galileo's contribution to the history of thought is to cut off mathematical reasoning at the kind of training wheel stage to air in public what true mathematicians considered unworthy scratch work at best. He experiments because he cannot think. He cannot reach insights by reason, so he turned to more simplistic methods, more hands-on methods. In physics, this blatant shortcoming has been mistaken for methodological innovation. But in the case of the cycloid, we see its true colors. We see that it's a sign of failure rather than of genius. Galileo's empiricism is the last resort of a failed mathematician. It is not science being born, it is science being dumbed down. I will argue for this conclusion in considerable detail in uh, many future episodes. In any case, the cycloid example, it obviously fits this thesis 
like a glove. So that's certainly food for thought at the very least. It is instructive to compare Galileo with Archimedes, who was a proper mathematician. Consider Archimedes' work on floating bodies. This is science done right, almost 2,000 years before Galileo. Archimedes' treatise is an outstanding masterpiece of science by the standards of any age. Only the mathematically literate could fail to grasp its immense significance, as indeed they have. Archimedes gives a thorough theory of the flotation behavior of paraboloids. That's the shape generated when a parabola is rotated uh, about its axis. You can think of a wine glass or a champagne glass. Uh, the cups of those glasses is kind of like paraboloids. Um, suppose you put the shape like that in water. Sometimes it will uh, float upright, sometimes it will tip over and so on. Under certain conditions, it's in equilibrium, and under conditions, not, it will wobble one way or the other. So, there are three parameters that are fundamental to the state of this uh, system. One is the inclination or tilt, so the, the angle that the axis of the paraboloid makes with the water. And the second parameter is the density. These are uh, solid paraboloids, so the material they're made of is heavier or lighter than water, or in whatever ratio. And uh, the third parameter is the steepness of the paraboloids, whether it's more uh, round like a wine glass or pointy like a champagne glass. Uh, the, the equilibrium conditions of uh, floating paraboloids depend on these three parameters in highly non-trivial ways. It's a complicated and complex matter to know what's going to happen if you vary any of these values. Uh, perhaps you're familiar with Dynamical systems and catastrophe theory kind of stuff from the 20th century. You know. it's, it's just like that. Uh, you, you have a phase space and the, the stable states, they make some complicated surface and so on. Here's an example of an application. Uh, think of an iceberg. It's floating, let's say, upright. But it's melting. It's becoming thinner and thinner. It goes from a wine glass to a champagne glass kind of shape. There will be a critical point when upright floating is no longer an equilibrium state. So the iceberg topples over. And even though the parameter changed only very slowly, the effect on the floating position was at first nothing for a long time, and then there was a dramatic collapse all of a sudden when uh, some critical threshold was met. Archimedes does all of that. or I mean, he doesn't mention, of course, applications like icebergs and so on, but he has all the mathematics for that to uh, answer these kinds of questions. He gives detailed exact quantitative predictions of the flotation behavior of paraboloids. When will it float? When will it tip over? Archimedes tells you all of that. And he's right. All of these very specific empirical predictions that he derives, they are all spot-on correct. But now, poor Archimedes, he's often misunderstood. So many people who don't care for mathematics they hardly even know, first of all, that this work even exists. And, but if they do look at it, they say, well, what's this, you know, a, a bunch of technical geometry about parabolas and stuff. Uh, Archimedes says not a word about any experiment, not a word about the empirical data, nothing about testing his theory, nothing uh, sciencey at all. It's just a bunch of intricate geometry. You might as well have opened any work on advanced geometry, like Euclid, Apollonius, whatever, it just looks like that. It looks like more geometry. So it seems to have very little to do with the real world, the physical world. Archimedes does have a few very basic postulates in the beginning, some common sense assumptions about how fluids push on the submerged objects. And that's the only link to the physical world. And after stating these two or three assumptions at the beginning, it's just all out geometry throughout the entire treatise from there on. So it has been easy for people to say, well, let some specialized historian of mathematics read all that technical gibberish. I'm a historian of science. I don't care uh, about all this Archimedes stuff because it says nothing about empirical science. The Greeks, uh, they maybe they were excellent geometers, but they didn't really do science, you see. They were uh, speculative thinkers, philosophers. They were great with abstract stuff, but they didn't have the sense to ground these fanciful theories in reality. That attitude is completely wrong, in my opinion. Ask yourself, 
What are the odds that Archimedes got this detailed quantitative theory of floating bodies absolutely spot on right if he was ignorant of empiricism and experiment and scientific method? Was he just sitting around doing a speculative armchair geometry and whoops, uh, just happened to come out exactly equal to empirical facts in a wide range of far from obvious uh, respects? What, are we supposed to believe that was just dumb luck? It doesn't make any sense. Of course Archimedes knew about the scientific method. Of course Archimedes tested his theory by experiment. That's obvious. His text doesn't say that he did those things because he was too good of a mathematician to think that that kind of kid stuff counted for much of anything. He only published the actual theory, not the obvious test that any fool with half a brain could do for themselves. Galileo, though, he was precisely that fool with that half brain. He spent his whole life spelling out those parts that Archimedes thought were too trivial to even mention. Now, people ignorant of Archimedes, they are readily tricked into thinking that this step by Galilei was somehow profound. Mathematicians know better. And this is why we need the mathematician's point of view represented in a historical scholarship and that is what you will get in this podcast and that will be the basis for my revisionist interpretation of Galileo's contribution to the history of science. Thank you.